Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching. I'm Gary Edelman with the American Battlefield Trust. That's Chris White behind the camera. Um, and we're in a place that I'm pretty sure hardly any, if any of you have ever been. We are in the office of New York Times bestselling author, uh, Jeff Sherrod. He's not here. He doesn't know we're here. Just kidding. Uh, he's actually right with us. So I hope, uh, I hope we thought you might enjoy, um, you know, getting to see the space where our favorite historical fiction writer actually works and does things. So, um, you know, Jeff's right here, Jeff, uh, you know, I I think people know of you and your father. So who's your dad and you know what's your connection beside the familial? Well, I got into this. I got started in the first place because of Michael Shara, my father. And the good place to start in my office is my archive of his work. Um, the Killer Angels, of course, is the, the book that he is the most known for by far. Um, and he, but he also wrote many other books, including a beloved baseball novel uh, called For Love of the Game, which is a film uh, starring Kevin Costner. Uh, and then there's you know, a couple other books that were less well known and a lot of his early science fiction work uh, that he, start, he started in the 1950s as a sci-fi writer. And uh, so he's, he covered a lot of ground in his 40 year career as a writer, but he never saw success. I do have to show you, this is one thing, Gary, I don't know if you've seen this, this is the this is rarer than the first edition hardcover wow. of Killer Angels. This is the Killer Angels with the woman on the cover. This came out in 1976 to coincide with the uh, the John Jakes series, mm. um, which was a pot boiler, you know, bodice ripper sort of story. Well, my father's head exploded when this thing came in, <laughs> when, you know, the publisher sent it to him, uh, because there's no woman in the story. <laughs> and it, it makes it look with her arms around the two soldiers, like it's a love triangle story. And he just went berserk and said, no, we're not, we're not doing this. So that's why it's, it's pretty rare. And they didn't print very many of them. So this is one of my prized possessions. <laughs> But, uh, you know, his career, as I say, uh, you know, the Killer Angels changed a lot of lives. Um, and a lot of people come to Gettysburg because of that book. Um, and it certainly changed my life. And part of the reason you're here and, and the reason we're doing this is, is that legacy. So, I mean, I'm happy to kind of walk around here and just sort of show you. Uh, and, and you can certainly guide me, Gary, on what, what you want to see. I'll be glad to. Well, I think people want to see a little bit more about the shelf because I guess the Killer Angels might have been reprinted once or twice and maybe in other languages. Uh, it's been, well, let's see. There's, um, here's Polish. Um, you know, this is, this is. And then there's also, I'm sorry, this is Portuguese. This is Polish. Um, and there's Chinese, if I can find it. There, I mean, this is uh, amazing. Um, he never saw anything like this in his whole career. And uh, to have, um, you know, to have his book so well received and being uh, as, as the monument that it is today um, would absolutely floor him. This is the Spanish version. I love this. Uh, Angelos Asesinos, Killer Angels <laughs> in Spanish. Great. Um, but, if I could have you go back, Jeff, uh, why did he not get to see these things printed into well, other languages? Sorry. It was the film Gettysburg came out. I have film Gettysburg right here. <laughs> and there's the, the audio book. Um, the film came out in 1993, made his book a number one bestseller five years after his death. He had no idea and, and would have no idea what he left behind. Um, up until that point, even though the Killer Angels won a Pulitzer Prize in 1975, it was never successful. If you think about 1975, those of us old enough to remember, it was the end of the Vietnam War. And nobody in this country wanted to read a book about generals. It was about as out of fashion a subject as you can imagine. And that, to his bitter disappointment, I mean, he had written this great book. He knew it was a great book. The Pulitzer people knew it was a great book. Nobody bought the book. Wow. I mean, it was never commercially successful in his lifetime. It was the film that made the book a, a bestseller. Wow. And then Ken Burns, too, didn't hurt either. Exactly. Well, exactly. Yeah. Well, walking around, too, um, I, I would give you the option to talk about anything here. I, I, I know and love your family, and I think it's just great that you're normal dad and normal husband, regular guy. But... Well, one thing I point out, this is just a little artifact, I mean, it's just a watch. Uh, my uncle, Richie, who I dedicated one of my Rev War books to, uh, was the team doctor uh, for the Florida Gators. And they oh, won, yeah. when they won the national championship and went to the Sugar Bowl, um, this was the watch, that I, I think I'm holding it upside down, this was the watch they gave all the, the principals on the team. And when he died, he died back in 2000, 
um, which is when I dedicated the book to him, uh, his daughter, my cousin, uh, Ellen, gave me his watch. So uh, that, that means a lot. That's, it's, it, again, it's a watch, but it's, it has a great deal of meaning to me. Uh, pictures of my family, um, my wife and daughter, you know, there's Stephanie and Emma, and uh, my, my best, my closest friend, Ralph Johnson and his wife uh, down in Tallahassee. Um, and then just sort of miscellaneous office-y things. I mean, there, there is my, I'm proud to say, there's my, my Christmas cactus. The reason I'm proud of that, I, I rescued that. It was a single stem that had been stomped on in a high traffic area in a yard. And I took it and put it in a pot just to see what would happen. And that was about 15 years ago. And that's what happened. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I feel pretty proud that I saved the Christmas cactus. This is the chair I do all my research. I've had this chair for a long time. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> it's cool. Actually, it's just a chair here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but it's also an extremely comfortable chair. And for doing a lot, as much reading as I do, I mean, this is a great place to sit. If what it's worth it, just if I may, real quick, I mean, when I'm trying to research something, I never have just one book. I need a table with another book and a notes and everything. Is this how you set it up? You just have one, one thing in one your hand? One book at a time. Wow. Well, I can't possibly read more than one book at a time. And in the same way, I can't possibly write more than one book at a time. And I know people, I mean, probably a lot of us do, who write two or three books at a, at a time. That would drive me insane. I mean, I, I have to focus on you know, exactly what I'm doing. And it's the same way with reading. I have to read one, finish it to the end, and then start the next one. All right, well, I don't think you'd be surprised to say that I think that my favorite part of your office is coming up right here, Jeff. What are we looking at? Uh, if you're looking all the way across, well, first of all, what you're looking at is the southern uh, part of the battlefield at Gettysburg. And then those two hills in the far distant are the round tops. The little round top on the left, big round top on the right. Um, this is where uh, General Collis, uh, the Union general who built this home in 1900, that's where his troops fought. And there's a lot of speculation that he, um, that he put this house where he did and put it with the height and the altitude that it has so he could look out over that ground where his troops were. And uh, that, that sounds good to me. These, um, by the way, I don't know if you've noticed these, these are trench art. These are World War I um, artillery shells, yeah. and there's two French 75s, and this is a British um, 80 that are, um, were, you know, imagine that the Doughboys or, or the, the Tommies sitting in their trenches with nothing to do, week on end. Um, they would take empty shells and with an instrument, whatever they had at, at hand, and make art out of it. And that's all of these, the same way this one actually says Verdun on it, 14 to 18. Um, it's just remarkable that, first of all, that they had a lot of time on their hands uh, when so many of them died, but the fact that so many of, of these things survived, and I've got another little piece I'll show you in a minute, but um, yeah, I did. I saw these and, and found out about them, read a book about them, I had to have them. I mean, I just, this, is, this is cool stuff. And I see your connection to your home state right over here, of course. Well, actually, before I want to go oh, right down here, this is a strap. Um, the wheel strap off a cannon, one of the VMI cannons the, that was you know, in the war, uh, that fought at the uh, Battle of Newmarket and some other places. Wow. This, four, there were six of them, six cannons originally. One sunk in the Potomac River is gone. Um, four more are on the parade ground at VMI, and I actually gave them a grant to restore them to bring them back to what they look like. You can see a hint right down here of red and a little bit right there they were originally painted red and so that that was the restoration we did but the the sixth cannon is in pieces the barrel the tube is at vmi and um the rest of the hardware is i think is busted up and it's not in shape they gave me this um just as a commemorative uh, as, a, as a, a token of their of the honor of you know what it took to restore their cannons um and it's, it's a unique gift. I mean, I don't know quite what you do with that, but um, it's, uh, I'm not going to put it on another cannon. But it's just kind of a cool thing, and it's really, really heavy, um, which is why it's sitting against the bricks. 
Maybe when we're not filming, I'm going to go over there and okay. fail uh, to pick it up. Uh, you're with the American Battlefield Trust. We're here with New York Times bestselling author Jeff Shera uh, in his office, and we're just taking a little tour around. We would love to see what comments you might have or what questions you might have, and maybe we can rep respond to those in the comments, and maybe we can even get Jeff to do some of those as well. Um, so, I'm sorry, so you went to Florida State, you're a Floridian. Yes, I grew up in Tallahassee, went to Florida State. My father was a professor there, taught creative writing and literature, and uh, I majored in criminology, and which I enjoy, really enjoyed, but uh, I had started a business. I was in the rare coin business from the time I was about 16, and I found out I wanted to be a game warden. I mean, I thought that was a very fulfilling thing. I grew up, I was a sort of a woods and water kid, and I thought being a game warden, I knew, I knew people that were doing some things they shouldn't be doing in the woods, and I didn't like that. So I, that was where I was aiming my career. And then I found out that I was making more, with all due respects to the state of Florida, uh, I was making more money in my coin business when I graduated than I could make as a game warden going to work. So, so I, the, it never came to pass. But the the, uh, the diploma looks nice. And I've, I've had this frame for years, and it just, it, it, make, it gives me credibility um, as an academic, I think, and even though it has nothing to do with history, um, <laughs> at least I have, see, I have academia in my background. What you really learn in college may have little to do with your career, <laughs> more right. about being an adult. Um, I don't know if what you might want to talk about next. I know there's something here we want to talk well, about. Well, first of all, yeah, we'll talk about the challenge coins. This is my collection of the, of the challenge coins that were given to me by various people around the world, and um, it's, uh, there's a lot of pride that comes in having these. Not everybody gets them. Uh, the way it works is somebody comes up to you, shakes your hand, and you realize that in his hand is, is a coin. You don't acknowledge it, you just put it in your pocket. And, it's, and the challenge is to you know, keep your mouth shut. Um, and a lot of uh, officers, particularly high-ranking officers, have these. Very few enlisted men have them, and I have two from uh, Master Sergeants given to me. Um, here's one right here. Uh, I'll hold it up and see if you can just take, hold it very still. This is, you know, really unusual because the enlisted men don't usually get the, you know, have challenge coins made for them. Um, but this fellow did and, and honored me with one. Um, some of these, this is the one I think that I value the greatest. This is a Medal of Honor recipient gave me this, um, his picture. Uh, Walter Ma Walter Marm um, at the Medal of Honor Society meeting in uh, Boulder, Colorado, uh, where they gave me the Bob Hope Award, which is an incredible award. Uh, and he gave me, he honored me with this. And I, I value this above all of the rest of these. But there is also um, a two-star general, three-star general, 101st Airborne, um, this one, uh, Air Assault, uh, the commanding general at uh, Fort Bragg said to me, um, you know, we would love to ha have you come and speak. And I looked at him and I said, well, sir, you're the fellow that can make that happen. <laughs> 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 but uh, yeah, there again, uh, in all due respect to the 101st Airborne, my father was in the 82nd, there's the 82nd Airborne. Nice. Um, so, I, you know, sort of cover both, both bases there. Um, yeah, this is the another three-star general. They don't have to settle for round coins. They can they can have them more interesting shapes. Uh, Lieutenant general. Um, I've seen them be numbered before too. I've seen a lot of them. Sometimes, other sometimes. Um, I I just like the artwork or the creativity that goes into them. Some of these are they're they're very macho. The sort of the pilots, you know, with the um, night stalker, you know, things like that. I mean, that's very cool. Some of them are simply people are just talking about, you know, who they are and what, what branch of the service they're in. So they're a little more modest, but uh, this is cool. And uh, you know, I, I dearly love these things. So, and this, uh, while we're talking about, you know, what I'm, what I'm proud of, I'm proud of um, what I'm working on next, uh, which is Teddy Roosevelt. And this is just a piece of my research material. I've read all these. Um, the, um, it, it's, this is going to be quite a project. I'm really happy about this is going to be different than what I normally do. It's not about a battle. It's not about a war, even though Spanish-American War is a part of it. Um, very, it's a very small part. But the, it's the man, Teddy Roosevelt, is the, what the story is about. And it's, he is a spectacular character. 
So I'm having a lot of fun with the research. I'll be writing oh, probably by about the 1st of August. And, um, and my deadline is in February, so I need to <laughs> I need to get going. Yeah, we better finish this interview. <laughs> uh, well, I, you know, I think the challenge coins provide a good segue, and I don't know if there's anything else on the way you really want to... Okay, it looks like we're going to open this door here. Okay, good. Yes, that is the segue. So you've written some other books, Jeff. Is that correct? Yes. This this is jeffshara.com. Uh, the... Um, this is the Inventory Center, <laughs> International Inventory Center. Uh, so this is where I keep, you know, copies of all my stuff and my father's stuff, and it's, it's sold through my website, and I, I um, uh, autograph everything, and you know, people seem to like that. So I, I've been doing this for a while now, and. Uh, I just think, you know, I think most people probably know that you were asked by a publisher to try to write what became um, Gods and Generals, and mm -hmm. it went well, obviously. So you wrote Last Full Measure, and then you did more Civil War, you did Revolutionary War, and then you did the war with Mexico, you did Korea, uh, mm -hmm. and you uh, have done numerous World War II books, the new of, newest of which is... The Eagle's Claw, which I have read and <laughs> couldn't prepare for Gettysburg 158 because I wanted to finish it. I, I couldn't put it down. So great job on this. So Thank you. You, you could have never seen, I suppose, from what you said before, this that this was your path. No, I mean, this is 26 years I've been doing this in 18 books. And never did I, when Gods and Generals came out, or when it was even when it was published, even before it came out, uh, the, the idea that people would care. People would pick it up and go, oh, I want this, or I'd pay money for this, or how about signing my book? I mean, that whole experience. Uh, the publisher, when Gods and Generals came out in, in uh, 1996, the publisher sent me out to 59 cities all over the country. It, it's a four-month book signing tour, and, I mean, it was grueling. But what I learned was, I mean, first of all, what I learned was the Civil War is a lot more popular in places you would never imagine. Places like Spokane, Washington, and Albuquerque. I mean, I had huge audiences come to hear the Civil War story. It's not just, you know, Richmond and uh, Antietam and Gettysburg and, and Atlanta. Um, it, it was really interesting to me to find, to learn that what kind of an audience there was for Civil War all over the country. And I've met people now all over the world uh, who have that interest. So, um, you know, to go on from that, though, I couldn't just keep doing the same thing over and over again. And that's why I went first to the Revolutionary War, then walked to World War One, World War Two, and Korea, and now back, and like I said, working on, t on TR. Um, it's, I am very, very lucky to be doing what I'm doing. And I've, I've met a lot of people who want to be writers or are trying to be writers, and they can't catch a break or they can't get an agent. I understand all that. Well, like the, the only thing I can tell them is keep trying. You know, just keep, you have to be persistent. My father learned that the hard way. I mean, he spent his whole career, you know, Killer Angels finally is published and his, you know, his Pulitzer Prize comes to him. But um, you have to be persistent if you're going to do this. And I hope you don't mind if I just expand on that a little bit, because one thing that you've said over and over, and I really enjoyed is that you're just, even if they don't like your book, they're taking the time to read your book and they want to give you feedback and you seem to like to interact with people even who don't enjoy it. Well, I say on my website that, you know, I, I welcome, you know, there's a link there, you can send me, a, you know, an email. Uh, and I welcome the emails, and I say, even, even from the grumpy people. Um, because if you've got something to say that you don't like about my book, I'm, you know, I'm listening. And, and what also happens is people catch mistakes. It amazes me how sharp people will be on something that I miss, and it happens in every book. Something, no matter all the proofreaders in New York and my editor and all of that, something slips through, and I'll get emails, and I'll get sometimes I'll get a dozen emails, um, sometimes only one. But the nice thing about it is the huge advantage that I have is we can fix it. You know, for subsequent printings of the book, we'll fix a typo, we'll fix a reference that I've made that's incorrect. Uh, so when, by the time the paperback comes out, ha, ah, it's right. <laughs> so, so then the grumpiness goes away. And I have a feeling a lot of people on there are gratified now. Those writers <laughs> out here who you, you try hard, you still make mistakes. So that's great that's to right. hear. I just, I can't help but notice that, uh, you know, Jeff was on the board of the American Battlefield Trust, then Civil War Trust and Civil War Preservation Trust for many years. And you've been very generous supporter of Battlefield Preservation. So this was one of our Lee's headquarters plaques that certain people got. And this here at the top is a room number. For
of the hotel. Uh, they're very popular, uh, you know, Larson's quality in that was there and you know, we had some of these left over. We found them in a box and uh, several of the people who were very generous to us. So thank you, Jeff, got those. Yeah, well, that's a very special, uh, very unique sort of artifact. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if anybody else who has a room door number yeah. in their thing. I would also point to uh, this here. That's Stephen Lang and I are in that plane as we're tail hooking landing on the Carl Vinson, the aircraft carrier Carl Vinson in the Persian Gulf. Uh, we were doing a project called Operation Homecoming, where we were going to various air bases, army bases, navy bases, to um, simply talk to these people, to convince them to write something about their experience. Um, and it didn't have to be blood and guts, we're not looking for that. Just what's it like being so far away from home, being away from your family. And then we went to the, the civilians, you know, the mother. What's it like to have your son in Afghanistan, you know, and so forth. And to, just because nobody writes anymore, nobody writes letters. So Operation Homecoming was, was founded by the, the National Endowment for the Arts. And Lang and I were both uh, parts of it. And it, this, the neatest thing I did was to tail hook down onto the Carl Vinson in the literally in the middle of enemy, you know, enemy territory. Um, and we spent a week there, and we also uh, landed on the uh, the destroyer uh, Mustin, uh, guided missile destroyer. And uh, Stephen gave his one man show uh, Beyond Glory on all these places. I think he put it on every night we were there. And uh, it, was, it was quite an experience. And you were allowed to go out on the deck of the carrier. It wasn't like they shuffled you off to some place and you had to sort of sit there and run your hands. No, we were able to walk around. And I mean, I remember putting my hand in the, on the flight deck or underneath the flight deck, the uh, hangar deck, put my hands on a box of laser guided bombs. I mean, they were just laying right there. It was a box. I, I went up and said, well, that's not something I ever expected to do. <laughs> so, um, but that was, you know, and the captain of the ship um, gave us, the, the Captain Donegan uh, gave us these uh, certificates, you know, honorary tail hooker uh, that I su successfully, he, he pointed out, arrested a landing and then catapult launch off the Carl Vinson. Um, wow. The successful is the operative <laughs> word that I'm the most proud of. So that, that was a, quite an experience. Very cool, Jeff. Uh, we're still uh, moving around here, and now we have books that are not yours, I think, over here. Unless I skipped anything you want to talk no, about, no, um, the, uh This is um, uh, mostly my research books uh, in this area. I mean, there's stuff from, from uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, more Teddy Roosevelt stuff, and World War II. Um, some of the books, uh, these, uh, Harry Butcher, who was Dwight Eisenhower's, uh, Captain Harry Butcher, who was Eisenhower's adjutant, um, autographed this book, not to me, but he autographed it back in 1946, and a fellow sent it to me and uh, said, you know, I thought you'd like to have this. Well, he's right. I mean, I'm very, very happy to have it. Um, a lot of things like that. I have books like, for example, here's a book about the Marquis de Lafayette, um, and as you can see, it's in pretty rough shape. Uh, this is um, a very old book, and I've got several of those. Um, it just, sometimes you find books in the, in the strangest places, whether somebody either gives it to me or I find them online, and have research material that nobody has. And I, I love that. This, um, oh, this is Myra Hancock's memoir, and it's, it's falling, literally falling apart, uh, of her husband, Winfield Hancock. And this is the story, my father used this story um, in The Killer Angels, of when they're in California, uh, when the parting of the ways with Hancock and Armistead. Again, you can see this is falling apart. But, you know, this was written in 1890. And um, it, it gave me ammunition for gods and generals to, to tell that story again. First edition of the Marquis de Lafayette's memoir published in 1825. Now the cover is not original, but the pages most definitely are. And this is something that you, uh, you you'd be really careful with. So. Jeff, I, I hope you don't mind if I bring on Ann Mitchell. She's uh, the family historian at uh, Ancestry and Fold 3. And I think Ann's got a question for you. Our users are always researching the real people in their lives much like you do. Mm -hmm. You obviously are a bit more experienced at it. 
how do you get at the essence of a person? How do you know who they are? I think that might be useful advice for them. Well, first of all, in all of my books, it's necessary, it's essential. That's like the key thing that I find that out. And the reason is I'm putting words in their mouths. Mm -hmm. And if you're putting words in the mouths of a major significant, you know, a significant historical figure, you better get it right because people care. And I actually had somebody say to me, and I've said this before, how dare you put words in the mouth of Robert E. Lee? Okay, if I dare, to, you know, if I accept that dare, they had better be accurate to who Lee is. Or first of all, my story doesn't work. The whole thing falls right. apart. So I would tell people that, you know, what I do in my research, I've got copies, there are modern biographies here of different people and so forth. But wherever possible, it's to go back to the original. Go back to the original sources, diaries, memoirs, collections of letters. There's a fellow who was with Teddy Roosevelt in the Amazon. There's a fellow that was with Teddy Roosevelt in the Dakotas. Um, that kind of thing is, you, you cannot... So you're not just researching the person, you research the people around them? You have to, because sometimes there's nothing you can research of the person. For example, exactly. Robert E. Lee never wrote a memoir. Um, George Washington never wrote a memoir. Exactly. Uh, on and on, you know, Eisenhower wrote one, but he's so vanilla how he treats people because he didn't want to offend anybody that you have to go to the people around him, like Patton, to really get what, you know, what people thought. So in, for my case, again, it's putting words in their mouth because of the dialogue that I have to find out by reading the people who were there. Uh, you know, that's you, the key. That's the key. It, who you know? Who was there? Who heard the words? You know, we don't know exactly word for word what a certain conversation might have been. We don't know Lee and Grant at Appomattox. You know, we right. know what happened there, and, right. but we don't know word for word. That's my job. You know, as the novelist, I can fill in those blanks, whereas the historian really can't, and unless they know, unless they have the facts. Unless it's written down, but you can get the essence of what happened, exactly. the feeling. And being that I'm writing fiction, I can fill in those blanks. So I can take that essence and create a scene. Excellent. Thank and, you. And while I have you, Anne, I just want to say because you're with the American Battlefield Trust and we have a nice arrangement going on with Ancestry Fold 3, so what's this nice arrangement, Anne? Uh, we work together Yes. Um, to bring people the history of the Civil War. We have all the historical documents online. American Battlefield Trust have all the battle information and uh, we give your members 30% off our site and... We bring you guys as much information as we can. And what was the website for that again? Do you remember? Or the code? Uh, Fold3.com slash battlefield. Slash battlefield. Good. All right, Jeff. Uh, let's continue you, around Jeff. here. Sure. Thank you. Um, and anything else you want to talk oh, about well, here? It just occurred to me that I just looked down and saw this. This is the original manuscript for the Eagles Club. Wow. This is what I always keep these. And um, it'll all be marked up and, you know, with all kinds of red ink and stuff. But it'll, um, this is, yeah, this is what it looks like. When, I mean, I type that and, and uh, send it off to New York. And uh, this, you know, this ended up being 349 pages, which is the smallest one I've done. But it's just kind of kind of cool. Yeah, when, really when, cool. I, when I look at this before it ever goes to New York, and I look at this and realize, wow, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot of work. <laughs> it's going to be great. So, anyway, so. Good. What else do we have here? Well, and what we've got here is another of the trench art pieces. This is what I can show you. I think, and I could be wrong, that this is 40 millimeter um, shell, uh, anti-aircraft shell, and there's six of them. And so it's six little drinking cups. Um, and yeah, I mean, what a kind of an odd thing. And, and I could be wrong on the size. They might be actually 30 millimeter if there's such a thing. Uh, I'm, I'm lousy with spatial things. <laughs> But uh, yeah, that was a this was a gift, and um, it's just really cool to uh, see something like that. Um, that somebody spent the time sitting in a trench somewhere creating a piece of art. So, cool. What's over here? I think I see more of your. Well, this uh, is my stuff. This okay. what I do is I take a few first editions of everything I've written, including uh, hardcover paperback and uh, the, sometimes the mass market paperback. And I and just keep a few so that I have, you know, for my own uh, archive, I have first editions of everything I've done. And scattered throughout are things people have given me or things I've uh, picked up along the road. This, I will point out, this was my grandfather's 
sewing kit in World War One. Now, how many of those have you seen? <laughs> well, I don't know. Knowing Chris White, maybe 60 of them. Yeah, right. Right. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, but you haven't seen my grandfather's. <laughs> so, but, um, Can I ask about the Tootsie Roll? What's going yes, on there? My book on the Korean War, uh, The Frozen Hours, uh, one of the things that the men survived, were able to survive, is because they were airdropped Tootsie Rolls. The reason for that, 40 below zero and everything else freezes to a point that you can't, you can't eat it. The Tootsie Rolls, you can put them in your mouth and you will survive eating Tootsie Rolls. Wow. And the, and the Marines did. Um, yeah, I mean, it's the Chosin Reservoir, exactly. I mean, that's an amazing thing. If you go to the, the uh, Museum of the Marine Corps, they have this book, or they had Frozen Hours on display, a really nice display, and right next to it, they had a huge display of Tootsie Rolls. I mean, it's like they tied them together. So that, uh, and also, I mean, I would point out this photograph. This is Peep Sanders, the late Peep Sanders. He, the book is dedicated to him. He was a Marine at Chosin. Um, he passed away about six months after the book came out and broke a lot of hearts uh, with that. But he was quite a character. And his sitting in my living room telling me uh, what his experiences were like and what he went through gave me a lot of information uh, that helped sort of flesh out uh, the story and, you know, talking about the essence of the characters, uh, the essence of that whole experience was, was pretty remarkable. So I owe, I owe Pete, uh, Pete Sanders a, a huge debt, uh, which I can never repay now. That's great, Jeff. Thanks so much. Uh, now, what I want to say, we just have a, another couple of things to look at here still, but I just want to say, you know, your body of work, I mean, we're selfish, we're a civil war and a revolutionary war and a war of 1812 sort of organization. And, and, and what you do, I mean, brings to life to so many more people that don't read nonfiction books. So we're really appreciative of what you do. Sure. And I'm going to use that as a segue to say, you know, that other people apparently appreciate your work as well. So if, if modesty doesn't prevent you, I'd like to look at what's on the wall and above the, your uh, father's books there. Well, these are my awards. <laughs> <laughs> but there's, no, there's no more subtle way to say it than that. Um, I am the only three-time recipient of the William Young Boy Award from the American Library Association. Um, I mean, that's, that's a pretty cool thing. Um, I was actually, I'll say this, I was considered this year as well, um, but I have a feeling somebody there said, we can't give him a fourth. <laughs> we can't just keep giving him these awards. So I, I didn't get it this year. But uh, I've got um, th this probably, I mean, this is the, the Lincoln Forums Award, um, the uh, awards from my alma mater from Florida State University, uh, the Arte's Award that they give every year. Uh, for the, in, in the arts, this is the, the College of Criminology at FSU gave me um, inducted me into their Hall of Fame, which is really nice. This one, I think, of all the ones I mentioned this earlier, this is the Bob Hope Award from the Congressional Medal of Honor Society. This thing is solid copper, a really interesting medal. And uh, I mean, only one other writer has ever been given this award, and that was Stephen Ambrose. So I'm, I'm really proud of this. So, so I, don't, I don't like to talk so much about awards. I mean, that's not, I, I never started out to be an award-winning author. I mean, the idea is just to write good stories. And my father taught his creative writing classes at Florida State. If you're going to do this, if you're going to be a writer, don't think about the bestseller list and don't think about, you know, getting published or an agent or any of that. Think about getting, writing a good story. Because if, it, if you don't start with that, it didn't, the rest of it's not going to matter. The rest of it simply won't happen. That was a lesson, I mean, I carried uh, a lot. The other thing, and I, I know you've heard this, Gary, um, my father taught his students, and I would say to any writer who, you know, who has an idea, who wants to be a writer, there is one lesson, one thing you have to employ, and that is the BIC method. B-I-C, but in chair. It's not going to happen. I meet people all the time that are walking around complaining that their story isn't being written. Um, that's because you're walking around complaining. Go home and write. Go home and sit in the chair. Um, that's what I do. You've seen my chair. Um, there's the chair. <laughs> there, that's my chair. <laughs> here's, here's, this is that's my desk. And I mean, that's, that's, this is where I do all of my work. And it, you know, it has to be done. It starts right there. Uh, you, you can't sit on a bar stool. I've known guys that do that. Um, 
But this is the greatest lesson I learned from my father is, is you know, sit down and write it and make it a good story. Make it a good story. I don't know how else to end other than that. Uh, Jeff, thanks so much. It's been great to take this tour of your office here. Thanks so much for what you do for, uh, you know, for our whole field and for, I know so many of your members will appreciate, our, our members and viewers will appreciate this. So thanks for taking the time and thanks to our uh, crew here and thanks to Chris White behind the camera. Thank you all for watching and for supporting Battlefield Preservation.